um, you're, you're actually uh, relatively quiet talk, aren't you? Especially a shop. Oh, yeah. 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 Is this best in the pocket or what? The transfer? Cool, you're making a nice noise. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well, Alan, clear. If I forget during the talk and I start to lower the mic and you can't hear me, then please shout out. Um, Mr. President, Rotarians, Jim, my host, it's a great uh, pr pr privilege and an honour to be asked to address you today and to talk about prostate problems. Like my prostate's not working. <laughs> Don't tell him, mate. No, they're not. There you are. Now, um, I'm going to structure my talk along these subjects. The prostate gland, its anatomy, what does it do? Where is it? Some of the common presenting symptoms. Other urinary symptoms which can mimic prostate problems, and I get a lot of referrals where I can reassure patients they do not have a prostate problem, but they worry about it when they come to me. The typical investigations that are needed, some of the common prostate diseases. I'll be concentrating more on uh, benign prostate enlargement and prostate cancer. Some of the newer treatment options, how possibly to keep the prostate healthy, and some of the future developments. So the anatomy of the, of the urinary system, it's imagine a town up in the hills where there's water being produced, collected in the hills. That's the kidney, that's where the urine is produced. And downstream it comes like a, a stream, eventually a river, and the estuary, that's the bladder. And below that is the controlling gland, that's the prostate gland, it's just below there. Doing well. uh, <laughs> can you hear me still? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Now, that's the bladder, and just below it is a plum-sized gland called the prostate gland. Its function in uh, certainly youth and uh, throughout most of male life is to produce a fluid which contributes to the semen, and it has a function in uh, nourishing sperm in fertility. But as one gets older, it can develop problems, and one of these is benign enlargement, so that the water pipe, which goes right through the urethra, which goes right through the center of the prostate, can get narrowed, and it can encroach on that pipe and cause a restriction to the flow of the urine. The other potential problem is infection, so patients can have infection in the prostate from time to time, which can act as a reservoir to cause elderly men to have repeated infections. It can also be a harbour for growth of cancer. Uh, statistics will say that that's very common the older you get, particularly men in their late 70s and 80s. Now, um, the prostate has, this is relevant to some of the treatments that we offer, prostate has two sphincter or valve mechanisms related to it quite closely. One of them is in, in fact embedded within the inner part of the prostate and the other one is just outside it encroaching and encircling the urethra or the water passage. In operations when we deal with the prostate be it to, to, to scoop it out which is called a TURP operation, I'll mention that briefly, it's to in, increase the flow of urine in those men where the prostate has grown enlarged and has caused an obstruction then we scoop up within that gland part of the fibres of this valve, so that can be damaged. But men still have quite a powerful second, second protection, and that is this, what's called the external sphincter, and that's left behind, so they are fine with that. But when we do operations for cancer, we remove the entire prostate gland, we cut it off here and cut it off here, and that approaches very close to this valve, which can be damaged, and then there is a theoretical possibility of developing incontinence of urine. So some of the common symptoms, I've listed them here, frequency, which means going often to the toilet, 
Somebody who goes more often in a 24 hour, hour cycle than eight times um, is deemed to have uh, greater than average frequency, frequent pattern of maturation. Urgency means not being able to control uh, your rush to the toilet and having to, uh, to go there precipitously. Nighttime frequency is quite a common related symptom, but other, many, other, many, many other conditions can mimic this. It's not purely related to prostatism. A poor urinary stream, hesitancy, which means slow to stop the, the urinary stream, intermittency, stop, start, stop, start, and a sensation of incomplete emptying. These are called now lower urinary tract symptoms, or we call them LUTs. Why? Well, because we've discovered over the last um, 20, 20 years or so that some of these symptoms women have as well. So they can, cannot just be due to problems with prostate. We used to call them prostatism. But women have prostatism that, that, uh, in that sense as well, that they don't certainly uh, have a prostate. So these symptoms are not specific enough to relate to the prostate. In other words, many of these symptoms can be related to problems with the bladder. So they can be related to problems that we now call storage problems. The bladder just cannot hold enough urine for comfort, and that is that leads to you needing to go more often to the toilet. And also problems of bladder emptying, which is re related to restriction of the flow, uh, perhaps because the bladder has got tired and doesn't push the urine out fast enough, or perhaps there is a restriction in the flow from enlargement of the prostate. And this is just, broadly speaking, these are the three types of uh, problems that you get with a bladder, which can mimic what we used to traditionally think of as prostate problems, a small structural capacity where the, prostate, the bladder can shrink in size for various reasons, uh, a small functional capacity, in other words, if you were to stretch it, it would hold enough urine, but there is pain for the patient to hold a large bladder volume, and therefore, functionally, it acts as a small bladder. Then in some patients, with chronic holding problems, with emptying problems, they can develop a very large bladder capacity, and that can lead to secondary problems with back pressure problems in the kidneys, for instance. So, some of the symptoms which can mimic <coughs> prostate symptoms can be more related to your lifestyle and your behaviour. So, fluid intake, I'm sure you, you're all very aware, wine, coffee, um, these can irritate the bladder, they can also stimulate the kidney to produce more urine, and it's particularly the caffeine in the tea and the coffee which is the stimulant, but alcohol can also increase it. We don't realize, but people with a very healthy diet, particularly those who have a lot of fruit and vegetables, which is absolutely the right thing to do, but that has a large water content and that can build up over the day and you can end up going more often uh, to the toilet at night, surprisingly. And of course there's other things like you know, people who get up at night because they are light sleepers and they sometimes have said to me, saying that they get up a lot at night and they must be the prostate. And medical conditions can exacerbate urinary symptoms and we have to look beyond our purely urological rule to, to try and diagnose these. Diabetic <coughs> patients can sometimes present, one of their first presenting complaints is going off into the toilet. But patients with heart problems, the circulation is poorer, so instead of pumping the blood around fast, the blood um, tends to leach out fluid into the legs, the legs and ankles swell, and then when they lie down at night, that fluid re-enters the circulation and it goes back into the kidney and they have to get up at night to empty all that water out. And so they get up at night. Patients who take blood pressure pills, various types of kidney disease, liver, and some medications, particularly blood pressure medications, can make you go more often to the toilet at night. We do a very initial screen. This is called the frequency volume chart, a very elementary way of dealing with it. You can do it yourself. I, in fact, quite often ask my patients to, to do this because it's quite, it's quite informative. You keep a chart of how often you go to the toilet for about four or five days and the amount you pass. And it can highlight easily some problems where perhaps the patient's producing just simply too much urine, drinking too much, uh, perhaps drinking the wrong, wrong, wrong types of fluid, or perhaps developing conditions which make them pass more urine at night. Correction of those problems may, be very, uh, may require a very simple approach and may require no further investigations of their prostate at all. So we try and do this as an initial screening um, uh, investigation. 
We do additional tests. We do an ultrasound scan to make sure the kidneys are healthy. We, as urologists, have measured for a long time the flow rate of a patient. That can be a bit up and down. Even your flow in the morning can be different to what it is at night. So we tend to measure it only once. So perhaps it's not as objective as we think it is, but it's better than simply hearing from the patient, my, my flow is poor, because with a flow rate measurement, which is on a graph, we can compare that value to other patients and norms. We do a urine test, look for patients of uh, presence of blood. We do blood tests, and one of them is a test that you may have heard of, it's called PSA, which I'll mention to you about later. Flow rates, we, we do a, a range of this. This is, pro, this is a, a normal flow rate where it zips up rapidly. This is somebody who's in their uh, 30s, perhaps. It zips up normally, reaches a high level, 25 mils per second, and then it goes down rapidly. This is somebody who's got prostate type problems where it's slow to rise and quite prolonged. And this is someone who's straining where they haven't got, uh, they haven't got enough power in the bladder. They're using their abdominal muscles to strain and push the urine out. I, I, I've mentioned briefly about prostate infection and inflammation, but I won't dwell on those. The conditions I really concentrate on tonight are enlargement of prostate, benign enlargement, and mostly I'll talk about prostate cancer. Benign enlargement in medical parlance, this is called <coughs> benign prostatic enlargement, BPH. It's a fairly common condition, although it may not cause any symptoms, but it's fairly common starting from the age of 40 onwards, and it reaches a peak about 70 to 80 years. It can cause those typical prostate problems that you hear about, but they can wax and wane. It's been published by a colleague of mine called Andy Law, who's, who's just recently retired as a consultant in South End, and he published a paper nearly 30 years ago, and it became an internationally well-known paper. Prostate problems can improve and then then, get, then, then can deteriorate again. And so it can be a bit uh, confusing to know whether or not a drug has been effective or not, because even the natural history says that sometimes these can uh, improve themselves. But it can certainly interfere with the daily activities of a patient. And we tend to largely approach the mild symptoms by giving lifestyle advice. Uh, severe ones may sometimes need to go on to, to have surgical approaches. If left untreated, we see fear of these nowadays because men are more forward about coming for help and seeing medical, uh, seeking medical advice. But severe cases, we still see occasionally they can lead to retention of urine, back, back pressure on the kidneys and kidney failure, <coughs> and bladder stones, blood in the urine, <coughs> etc. So the simplest measures I've mentioned already, mild cases you can deal with by li advice and lifestyle, the type of fluids they drink, the, uh, the approach to uh, better treatment of medical conditions, the amount of uh, fluid, etc. Specific treatments, it depends on the, if there's a medical condition which is contributing. I mentioned as an example, untreated diabetes or untreated heart failure. So these can be, can be dealt with by the patient's GP and we'll make our suggestions about it. Drug therapy, um, there are two types mainly, prostate relaxing drugs, which relax the, the, the tiny amount of muscle component within the prostate gland, and that will reduce the resistance to the flow of the urine. And so that will work quite quickly. Within two, three days, the patient will notice some relief. The second type is a prostate shrinking drug, but that, although it's got fewer side effects, takes a long, lot longer, up to a year, for the prostate to shrink to roughly about a third less than what it was. Some uh, countries, particularly France, they are quite uh, quite keen on plant plant extracts, and some some you may have heard about this. Sol palmetto is one such, and these extracts have fewer side effects, but they're not as potent either. Then surgery, which you have the conventional open up, you've got the conventional operations, which in the past were open. Um, the last 30, 40 years, we've been using TURP, which is a type of keyhole operation through the urethra or water pipe. And we've got some newer techniques, which I'll mention. And in some patients, they're not fit for surgery, sadly. And for them, palliation, which means you can't cure it, so you have to palliate by using incontinence devices, such as catheters, which have some benefit in that you can 
avoid surgery, but they have lots of complications such as discomfort and infection problems. So the conventional treatment, TORP was the gold standard. This was an imported operation to Britain, which was brought by uh, my predecessors, um, one particular uh, teacher of mine who retired just when I was a senior registrar at the London Hospital, John Blandy. He went across the States in the, in the 40s and uh, the 50s, and he learned this technique and popularized it in this country, where you use a small telescope with a little cutting wire current, and you insert it through the penis under an anesthetic, then you chip away, scoop out the prostate gland, and create a larger channel. And that became the standard. It was, in fact, the defining operation of a urologist. Prior to that, general surgeons used to do neuro neurological procedures, just like uh, they used to do a lot of things, orthopedic procedures, gynecological procedures, but urology was not really a separate uh, specialty. But then urologists developed this. In, in the past, general surgeons used to do open prostatectomies. They used to cut, they can open cut, but urologists developed the skills and then became, became a, a subspecialty or a specialty in its own right. Sometimes, very rarely even now, we still go back to open surgery for very, very large prostate glands. The new therapies, you, you may have heard about this, laser. Now, I think it's not a panacea. I do have some patients who say, well, you can't have a laser, laser operation. Laser is good and has, has its benefit, but there are relatively few centers that provide it. The equipment is fantastically expensive, and so not all centers have it. But the benefit of laser is that it causes less bleeding. So those patients who perhaps have a tendency to bleed or the risk is higher than bleeding, they would, they would definitely benefit from an approach with a laser type of operation. And there are two types, a Holmium laser and a green light. Both are advertised in some of the, uh, some of the hospitals in central London. There's a new technique called bipolar vaporization, but that's another a safe way of operating on the prostate gland with minimal bleeding. So I'll move on now to prostate cancer. And this, as you probably know, is, is quite a common, uh, common condition. This is the PSA molecule. It stands for prostate-specific antigen. And this is where it usually starts. Many men do not have any symptoms uh, whatsoever related to, to their ultimate diagnosis of prostate cancer. But they will have had a health, health screen check or as part of their blood test done by the GP, they'll have had a blood test for PSA. And the explanation usually given is that it's, uh, the one I give certainly, is it's a, it's a blood test which looks at abnormal activity in the prostate gland. It's not really specific enough to tell you that it's actually cancer. It's not good enough for that. And it never was intended to be a diagnostic test for prostate cancer. And, but it became uh, a surrogate test for a prostate cancer. So people started thinking, ah, it must be, if somebody's got a raised PSA, they must have prostate cancer, but it never was the case. What it does tell you is that maybe there is something wrong with the prostate. It may be nothing of uh, consequence, it may be just simple enlargement with age, but you can have infection. Sometimes somebody has a uh, urine infection, if you check their PSA, it'll be very high. And it'll go down again though, within two or three weeks. Benign enlargement can put it up, age can put it up, but also can, so can cancer. So, as I've said, it's not very specific for prostate cancer, but it is an early indication and many men who are referred to our, our clinics will have started the process off by having a PSA test. It does become useful, however, once you know which of these conditions the patient has, particularly if they've got a diagnosis of cancer, then PSA is quite useful for following up. There are new tests for screening for prostate cancer which are much more accurate. Some of these are still in development. Some are now already being released into the commercial sector. So they are available in, uh, particularly in the private hospitals, but not yet in the NHS. And they're quite expensive, so the NHS don't really think they're necessarily uh, cost effective. They are looking at gene or genetic risk for prostate cancer, and so they are a bit more accurate. But if you look at it this way, PSA is about 30% accurate, or 30% of patients with a raised PSA will have may have prostate cancer. PCA3 is about 50 to 60 percent accurate. The latest talks I've been to in international meetings, they're talking about not just using one of these or two of these tests, they're using a panel of tests which will increase that accuracy to about 90 percent and then 
you hope you'll be able to avoid doing unpleasant things that I'll mention, such as biopsies. This is the thing, a rectal examination, and it's not pleasant. But it does help us to enhance the accuracy of a diagnosis if you already have a, if you know the PSA. But many, many of these, this is, this is this, what's called a staging system, depending on whether you can feel a little lump on the prostate or not. So T1, you can't feel anything at all. T2, part of it. T3, it seems to go outside the prostate gland. And T4, where it's gone into a neighboring structure. We, if we think the prostate gland is suspicious or the PSA is high enough in relation to the patient's age, then we will perform what's called a transrectal ultrasound scan. This is a typical appearance that I see when I do this. You see a sort of dark, dark granular gray structure, and uh, this is the sort of typical appearance of it. And we have our probe in the rectum, and we will anesthetize this area here, which is the rectum, and then put a needle in to various angles of the prostate gland, take lots of samples. And this is the illustration of what was done. A probe is put in, we put a needle in, anesthetize this area. The prostate gland is there, bladder just above it. So needless to say, you're going to have some blood in the urine afterwards. The other potential serious risk, it's rare, but it can happen, is because we're going in through the back passage, and passing a needle in through the back passage, which is dirty, and the needle courses through that into the prostate gland, which is a clean area, you can get infection. So we do give the patients uh, two or three antibiotics, not just one, to try and prevent this problem. If it's diagnosed, what is prostate cancer? Well, generally, it's a slow-growing disease. It becomes more common with age. Even if I didn't know about someone's PSA and I hadn't examined the prostate gland, a man in their 80s, I would, I would have a guess, and I'd be right, would have something like an 80% chance of having uh, a little bit of prostate cancer in the gland. This is from statistics from people who've had post-mortems and so forth. So it does rise and it is very common in men over the age of 70 years. But not all that cancer is life-threatening. In other words, that because it's a slow-growing disease, the patient uh, will die of something else. 50% will die of something else. So, um, there are variations in severity, and this is what John Blandick, to use another of his phrases, Professor Blandick at the London Hospital, used to call them the tigers and pussycats. Tiger prostate cancers are really life-threatening. They will, they will be the ones, unless you do something about them, they will threaten the life of the patient. There are pussycats, which will be not quite dormant, they are cancers, they will grow very slowly, but they are the ones who will not kill the patient. But remember, all that is changing. Patients are living longer and longer and longer. So what we used to see, maybe 20, 30 years ago, and which, which we didn't think was life-threatening because the patient wouldn't live long enough, because of the increased life expectancy of our patients, may well become life-threatening. So everything about the, the aging population, we have to rethink how we think about these slow diseases, such as prostate cancer. Anyway, um, there are variations, variations in severity, and we're not that good at differentiating between the lions, uh, the, the, the pussycats and the tigers, but we're getting better at it. There are various treatments available, and I'll mention them shortly, but they're based on the patient's age, and I've already said there are some, uh, some, some thoughtful discussions going on about this and whether the disease is confined to the prostate gland, which could be amenable to curative treatment, or if it has spread. So simply taking out the prostate gland, it's a bit like shutting the, the doors uh, after the, the horses have bolted, the stable doors after the horses have bolted. So it's no good to give a, a, a treatment just confined to the prostate gland if the disease is spread elsewhere. So you, you would offer some other form of treatment. Usually that's palliative, but there is good palliative treatment available. There are conventional treatments, which I'll talk about, and some emerging or modern treatments. And we judge the severity of the prostate gland currently by the biopsy specimen. There is a scoring system based on uh, development of a, uh, a system called Gleason, named after an Irish-American pathologist. <coughs> we look at the PSA reading, how high is it, the amount of disease we've detected in the prostate tissue, and whether or not, as I've said, the disease spread beyond the prostate gland. 
We can use staging scans. This is an example of an MRI scan. This is the water passage right in the middle. It's the prostate gland surrounding it. We don't use MRI scans for everybody, but those with higher risk disease, we would uh, stage the disease with MRI scan. And also with a higher PSA, we will do a, a bone scan. Why these two? Well, particularly because um, prostate gland is a propensity to spread to lymph glands, similar to you know, if you have a sore, a sore throat, you can have glands in, increasing your neck. Well, uh, you can have enlarged glands inside the tummy, and prostate cancer tends to spread up into the lymph glands, and this MRI scan is very useful for telling us if it's gone beyond the prostate gland and into the lymph glands as well. And the bone scan, different cancers have propensities to spread to different areas. Bowel cancer can spread to the liver. Then other types of cancers can spread perhaps to the lung, etc. So prostate cancer has a propensity to spread to bone. So we do a bone scan particularly in those patients who have a high uh, PSA. The conventional treatments, well, long, long time ago, way back in the 1920s, a chap called Young in the States developed an open cut operation called radical prostatectomy. It soon fell out of, this, out of favor because the patients were incontinent afterwards and had lots of complications and problems. So it, people stopped doing that and radiotherapy became the, the favorite choice of treatment. But in 1970s, uh, there was a chap called Professor Walsh again an Irish-American, and this was at the famous Johns Hopkins um, Institute in America, in, in uh, Baltimore. And he developed a, a more, a, a more uh, methodical approach to the operation, a very accurate one, based on many uh, types of dissections and so forth, and a better understanding of the anatomy. And his results were published, and they were a, a revelation. So an operation that had fell out of favor became, uh, had a rebirth, a renaissance, and it became popular again. So this was this not quite overtook radiotherapy, but it became very much more popular. And in uh, addition to that, it showed, although there were not side by side trials, never has been, but uh, in terms of long term survival, surgery does seem to have an added advantage. But it still does require a certain amount of fitness for mm -hmm. anaesthetic. It's a long operation, and therefore. For those who are fit enough to have it, they have an advantage. But for those who are not very fit from an anaesthetic point of view, it's still better to, to go for, for, for radiotherapy. But there are newer techniques with surgery, and uh, I'll mention a little bit about it, keyhole techniques or laparoscopic surgery. So radiotherapy still has a place, a very good place in the treatment of prostate cancer. This can be external beam radiotherapy that's coming from outside using radioactive sources like cobalt, and we've got linear accelerators, some, some new ones installed in the Queen's Hospital. And this has improved as well. Just like surgery has improved over the years, radiotherapy has improved. So it's more precise. It doesn't do as much damage. I showed you that slide right, right on earlier on where I showed, about, I showed you the, the close relationship of the prostate gland to the back passage, the bladder above, the valve below and something I didn't mention, but the nerves to the penis go very close to the prostate gland. So all these structures are easily damaged by all these treatments. So radiotherapy particularly used to be bad for damaging the, the back passage behind it. So patients didn't have many problems initially, but as the years went on, the damage became more evident. So they would get um, symptoms of blood in the back passage, irritation, so forth. But even radiotherapy has improved. So it's better focused, better locally localized to the prostate gland, less damage to the surrounding tissues. Um, a development of that is what's called seed placement or bathytherapy. These are radioactive, tiny, tiny seeds which are put in by hollow needles into the prostate gland. And that has an advantage in that with radiotherapy, you have to attend the hospital for several weeks, something like six, seven weeks on, on a daily basis. With bathytherapy, it can all be done in a single treatment. But not everybody is suitable for this. The prostate gland has to be smaller and the cancer has to be less aggressive. The newer, newer techniques, well, there are two. And I'm sure more will emerge, but the two are basically freezing it, which is a bit like the type of uh, liquid nitrogen that you know, many people maybe, 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 maybe heard of is the same that you use to treat warts and skin, the same principle. Uh, it freezes the tissues and kills off the cancer cell. 
The other one is high intensity focused ultrasound, and I'll mention this a little bit later on. And that heats the prostate gland to very high uh, very high temperature levels and kills off the prostate gland. Cancer. Now, the open cut surgery, it is very major, as I say, you have to be fit enough for it, and it can cause problems with incontinence of urine, control of that, impotence, particularly very high risk, about 80 90 percent. Although that can be treated with medication, such as Viagra, the success is very good. Radiotherapy, external beam, or brachytherapy. And this is brachytherapy shown in this diagram where the surgeon is putting in these needles. And the same sort of probe is used that we use to take biopsies. And you get a similar picture to the one I showed you of the prostate gland on an ultrasound scan. So the surgeon would have this probe, ultrasound probe, sitting in the back passage. And he would have this template, lots of tiny holes. And a radiotherapist would be sitting beside him, telling him how much of these seeds to place and what dose to uh, place, depending on the configuration and size of the prostate gland. And you can see these iodine seeds, uh, they're seen on this x-ray. Tiny, tiny seeds all through that prostate. This, these are the pubic bones here. Keyhole surgery, well, that developed, really took off in the last um, six, seven years. Um, in this country, perhaps only in the last four years, but in America, about maybe six, seven years ago. But it was invented for prostate in France. So that's where it started. And the advantage is that with those patients, with those surgeons who have developed the skill, it's a very, very, very skilled operation, and there are not many surgeons who can do this, and that's a disadvantage. It's not widely available. But where it can be done, the recovery is a lot quicker. It's a lot less painful. The patients can go back to their usual activity, be it, be it if you're retired, you, whatever you enjoy your hobbies, or if you're working, going back to work. It's a big advantage. And this is an example of it being done. Um, a camera is put in through a small incision just below, below the belly button, and a number of other little hollow tubes, metal tubes, are put in. And through them, instrument, instruments are in, inserted. The instruments are guided in, and they are able to discharge energy of various types, such as heat energy. And you can also put in scissors. You can put in instruments from left and right to stitch areas where you've cut, you've cut the prostate out and you join the water pipe to the bladder and all that can be done through these keyholes. So there are multiple cuts but they are all small and they, they heal very well, the patient can get out very well. This is an example of a picture taken, uh, some lymph glands being removed very close to the prostate gland and this is how it's done. So this is the instrument, this is actually a, a co coagulation instrument or a cauterizing instrument. And this is a pair of scissors, tiny, tiny things, and that's how the dissection is done. And because the magnification is so great, you can see tiny vessels and reduce the risk of bleeding. Prostate operation was, uh, open operation still is quite challenging. It's deep down in the pelvis, difficult to access, and you've got, you know, particularly surgeons with big hands to get in there. It's quite difficult. This is a great advantage. <laughs> this is a great advantage. You can see fantastically well. Now, this is the future, well, it's actually the present. This is the Da Vinci instrument. What it is, it's a concept developed by the American Navy because they were worried about their personnel having um, severe injuries and coming onto an aircraft carrier, and perhaps their <coughs> surgeon on board not having the necessary, necessary skill set to deal with perhaps an appendix operation or very complex operations. What they had, the concept was this, this was remote surgery. At the moment, this, in this model, you have the body of the patient here. Well, there's no, no patient here, but this is an example. This is the, the robot with lots of these instruments going into the body. The same instruments that I showed you in laparoscopic work, which were manipulated by hand. Here, it's being manipulated by a robot here at that point, but the actual robot itself is controlled by the surgeon here. So the picture inside the abdomen is transmitted to this viewing console, it's like playing video games, just like video games. And that's why surgeons love it, it's a toy. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, it's phenomenally expensive. 
and it's a selling point. In America, where they can do this kind of thing, it's actually now, I think something like, I just heard this statistic very recently when I was out uh, there, it's 65% of uh, operations, prostate cancer operations, mm -hmm. are done robotically now. Cool. I don't think that will happen in Britain, where it's more tightly controlled. And really, it, in here, it will happen if it's shown to be more beneficial. Well, what are the ups and downs of this? So firstly, the advantage is that Surgeons can learn quicker. So for newcomers coming into keyhole surgery, probably this is an easier way. Why is it? Well, because the instruments, you can actually see 3D. They've actually developed this site to look at it in three-dimensional, whereas laparoscopic surgery is, is 2D. It's mm. slightly difficult until you get used to it. It's difficult to learn. Also, the instruments are very clever. You can actually have at the bottom of these instruments, they're like little hands. So you're manipulating little hands fingers and hands. So it's a bit like mimicking what we really do, what we've always done. So it's very, very clever. Now, the first, uh, the, the, the real power of this, and I think the Navy gave up on this and sold the whole rights to this company called Innov uh, I think Innovative Surgery or something, and they, they marketed as the Da Vinci system. But um, the first kidney transplant um, was done, uh, transatlantic, uh, about a year and a half ago, where at Guy's Hospital a patient had his kidney uh, taken up, I should say, for, for the first part of the operation, uh, donor kidney, by a surgeon in the States. So there's a team of surgeons sitting by or standing by in, they put the keyhole instruments in first, but the robot was then connected up to those instruments, and the operation was done and controlled by a surgeon in the States. So it shows you, it, you know, the, the distance is immaterial. As long as you've got a good link, good pictures, you can be 10 yards away, as happens uh, in, in, this, in this country, or it could be, you know, uh, three, four thousand miles away. So that's Amazing. that's modern. But as I say, it's at the moment the proof is that it's choice of the voice. <laughs> it's still not to the patient. It still hasn't proven anything because the patient will still come out of it still with the same small holes as someone who has uh, keyhole surgery in the conventional way. Both are fairly new, but I think if you have a, a, a master surgeon who has done a lot of keyhole surgery. He will be, you know, he'll pro provide the service in an excellent way and probably just as good or better than this. You know, this mm. is still a relatively new technique. So, and as I say, the cost is phenomenal. Uh, each of these machines cost about six hundred thousand pounds. That's not the only cost. There are running costs um, every time these instruments, because of lots of uh, regulations to support about sterilisation, they actually they have to use uh, disposable instruments. And so each it's, each time you change that set of instruments. It's phenomenally expensive. Right, cryotherapy. This is one of the newer techniques. It's not that new. It's been around for at least 20 years. And in the context of prostate cancer treatment, it's been around at least 50 years. But it's not been a, a mega player in the treatment of prostate cancer in comparison to surgery and radiotherapy. So it's in that sense, it's a, it's a newcomer. And bear in mind, that results for any treatment for prostate cancer have to be compared with a natural uh, life expectancy of 10 to 15 years, even when the patient isn't treated at all. So results are quite difficult to come by when you look at any treatment for prostate cancer, unless you've followed the patient up for a long period of time. So you've got to compare that. Um, so cryotherapy is freezing on the prostate gland, and uh, it, it can be effective. This is the goal to... to, to eradicate the cancer with minimum toxicity. You put in these tiny needles into the prostate gland, a bit like brachytherapy, but instead of these hollow needles in brachytherapy uh, delivering a little seed of radioactive iodine, this delivers liquid argon, which is at minus, something like minus 190 uh, degrees centigrade. So it creates a little ice ball at the tip of the needle, and you can monitor this in the same fashion, which is a little ultrasound scan probe sitting in the back passage, and you see a little ice ball developing. Now, cryotherapy also, very much like general, uh, like the open prostatectomies, the surgery, had a, a period when it went through a, a reput reputational crisis because the, the safety issues were not really adequately looked at. And these ice balls were burrowing, burrowing through the rectum and creating holes in the rectum. Uh, this was about 20, the early days, 20 years ago, and the control was very poor of where the ice ball was created, how big it was, how quickly it developed, 
And so these people developed a condition called fistula, which means a communication, a hole between the rectum and the water passage. So you can imagine, I'll just leave it to your imagination, what the complication that is. It was horrendous. So it fell by the wayside. But the modern techniques are different. Modern cryosurgery has developed a long way. And that has come in conjunction with development of modern uh, computer technology and uh, ultrasound scan machines, which are much better and give real-time images of what, what it looks like. And also heating the back passage so it doesn't get damaged back again. And that's the size of the ice ball. And you produce a lot of these ice balls in lots of the parts of the prostate gland. And then you heat, sorry, you freeze the prostate gland, and eventually the tissue dies and it comes out. You pee, it is peed out through the penis. Sorry, going the wrong way. So it, it can be useful, but as I said, all these new techniques, you have to watch them very carefully because it's relatively new. We know that we know that surgery works, and we know that uh, radiotherapy works. So we have to be sorry about that. <laughs> Somebody wants me. Um, so we have to be careful about the effectiveness and observe uh, closely the effectiveness of these newcomers, the new entries, relatively newcomers, and they have to show that they're not only effective, but they have fewer side effects. So, this is a technique called HIFU, High Intensity Focus Ultrasound, that I've developed an interest in. And this is something that I've been speaking to Jim about, and how we met up. What is it? Well, it's ultrasound treatment, and it was delivered, it was developed, I should say, by uh, a, a chap called Professor Gelli in Lyon in France and what he did was he looked at this technique of focusing a, a beam of ultrasound with effectively like a mirror, uh, sorry, a, a magnifying glass which you show you, we all played with those, you know, trying to burn a spot on a, a piece of paper but instead of the sun's rays being focused in through an ultrasound scan, uh, sorry, through a magnifying glass, this is a, uh, an ultrasound scan being focused in through a specialized magnifying glass and being focused onto a bit of tissue and heating it up. So he, he treated various tissues, uh, went on to develop this same model for dogs, in fact, a prostate. And so he looked at dogs' prostates initially and then went on to develop this uh, machine called an ablotherm. And that had a European kite mark of safety, and that was in 2000. And since then, he's been, he's been doing his uh, procedures. Um, on his own, but also in multi-center studies in Europe, with uh, linking in with Germany and other parts of France, and since then it's also emigrated to other parts of the world. And this is probably some of the men are, are cringing now when they see this. This is what goes into your back passage. Um, it has <laughs> it has two probes: uh, an imaging probe, which you use to see what you're doing, and it gives you that picture of the prostate, the typical picture of the prostate I showed you earlier, and a treatment ultrasound generating probe which heats the prostate. God. And this is the this is what I was telling you about, the, the magnifying glass effect. So the ultrasound, the probe would be sitting here, the back passage would be here, and this is the magnifying glass and it would uh, put in your, your beams of ultrasound going on to a tiny focal point here, but there's a little bit of heating on either side of that tissue and it's a tiny, tiny um, spindle of tissue that's heated. So clearly, um, the probe has to rotate and heat the prostate a tiny bit at a time, and it takes about two, three hours to heat the entire prostate. You can't. You may ask, you know, why don't you heat the whole thing and get it over with in ten minutes? Well, you can't, because if you heat it to the, the, the temperatures that this can, heat, can generate, which is 90 degrees, you'll have an explosion. Um, so, so it's like a popcorn drop. <laughs> so you do it at a tiny bit at a time. The concept I like to say is like like a combine harvester going up and down, up and down. But it's in three dimensions, so it's not just a flat field. It's going up and down, up and down, as well as in three dimensions. So that it's all regulated. It's automated. Once you set uh, you plan out your treatment, it's all regulated by the machine. And this is the system. So the patient, I did two of these treatments yes, yesterday. I was telling Jim, after a long, long struggle getting it uh, approved and so forth, because everything is very tightly controlled, everything. So I managed to get funding for this at last with uh, lots of support from lots of people. 
And this, uh, I treated two patients, one who had never had any treatment before, another one who had uh, radiotherapy, and sadly it hadn't worked for him, and after a couple of years it had come back. And in, those, in the past times, what we used to do is to put them on to um, medical treatment, and that wasn't curative. So they, they had their chance, they wouldn't be cured, and at some stage they would die from the disease, they knew that. So that, that wasn't a pleasant thing to, to have to contemplate for patients, particularly who'd had radiotherapy, therapy perhaps in the early 60s, and they knew it had come back when they were late 60s. They were still very healthy, well in every way. So HIFU and cryotherapy um, allows them to have a second chance. You can ask, why don't we try radiotherapy again? Well, it's not possible. Radiotherapy has human, what we call cumulative damage. You can only do it once. Surgery, we can't do it twice because the prostate's gone. So if it comes back after surgery, it's difficult. Um, can you do surgery after radiotherapy? Well, it's theoretically possible, but the radiotherapy does damage tissues around the butt. And I mentioned to you about the, post, the, the back passage that's damaged as well. So if you remove prostate glands after radiotherapy, it's very, very difficult and they have a lot of complications. That's the rationale for trying to develop new techniques like HIVO. So what we do, we have the patient lying on the side and then uh, there's a computer console where we look at the prostate gland and recreate the image in three dimension after after it's scanned. And this is this is the probe going in, beginning to start heating up, heating up the prostate bit at a time. And these are the tiny spindles um, of the tissue being treated. And it, it usually takes about two, it's a small gland, about two hours. Larger glands take about three. And this is just the treatment being uh, being conducted. So we plan each each treatment. We look at the, the, the depth of the tissue, the amount, and each spindle is. Uh, this is what's still to be done. This is the bit that's already been treated, and this is where the the, the probe is sitting in the back passage. And we can look at it in two ways. You can see. I think I showed you an MRI picture before. You can see the prostate here, and. Uh, few weeks later, just the tissue beginning to slough away uh, the treatment's done. If you're lucky, then <coughs> the treatment will show the PSA initially, because the prostate is damaged, a lot of PSA is released into the bloodstream and been detected by a blood test, which shows a sky-high rise in the PSA very shortly after the treatment. But then it drops away to very low levels, and that's in a uh, situation where the prostate um, treatment's been effective. In some situations, however, the PSA can go up, go down, and then start drifting up again. So that suggests that not all the cancer has been eradicated. But the good thing about HIFU, unlike radiotherapy or surgery, is that HIFU can be re repeated. Mm -hmm. There's no cumulative damage to ultrasound. Ultrasound is, you know, it, we use it to, to scan babies, you know, and use it to you know, scan pregnant women. So it only heats it at the very point and damages the tissue at the focal point. So structures that it's gone through, other tissues that it's, it's gone through, it, it doesn't damage. So that's the, the benefit. We don't know how many times it can be repeated, but the evidence from Lyon and uh, other centres in Germany suggests that certainly it can be repeated once and perhaps even twice, quite safely. So um, what does it offer? Well, it's a minimally invasive treatment. It can be repeated and it doesn't exclude other alternative therapies. Surgery can be difficult after I've, well, I've been told, because I, I haven't um, particularly done it myself, because it's relatively new here. But in Lyon, they say they have done surgery, but there's a lot of scarring around the tissue. But certainly, you can have radiotherapy afterwards. Some people may have chosen to have high rather than radiotherapy. And if for some reason, they don't want to have high again, it, it, can, it can be done. It certainly is an ideal treatment instead of long-term medical treatment, which is just palliative, it's an ideal treatment for patients who have had radiotherapy and it's stopped working. Now, NICE brought out this guideline in, initially in 2005, saying that they were happy with high treatment. But in uh, February last year, they brought out guidance saying that high flu and cryotherapy haven't been around long enough for them to be used routinely in NHS practice. So that, that was quite shocking to a lot of people who had seen the results and so forth. So that was challenged. And that was chance. As you probably know, NICE is the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and they have a uh, sort of overarching role in restricting treatments which they feel are cost effective. They're not necessarily um, saying that it doesn't work. What they say is not, it's not cost effective enough for routine funding in NHS. But what they, do, what they did when they were challenged is they 
uh, looked at the data again, went through all the arguments of uh, the urology association, um, industry and so forth, um, and they have said, they, they modified the, the stance. What they've said is, can be used, can be funded, they are happy to fund it in NHS, provided it goes within two contexts, either a trial situation, so it's looked at very carefully, or in an audit situation, so it's entered into a database registry. So any, all patients, and that's quite right, I, I agree completely with that, so anybody who's treated, all the information is kept in a national register. So every year, every two years, every three years, you look at everybody's results around the country and you see that it is effective. It's getting a lot more scrutiny than surgery and radiotherapy ever had in the early days. Because that's the way things are. You know, everything's much more heavily regulated. But that's the <coughs> issue. You... Now, what about the future? Well, I think all these treatments are probably some sort of transition treatments. I think uh, we will be dinosaurs when these surgeons will be done out of our business. Mm -hmm. And there'll be these tiny nerves knives going into you know these uh, individual cells, cancer cells. I don't mean knives, obviously. I mean, they mean maybe a chemical which can be targeted only to, to treat these specific cancer cells and not uh, damage the healthy tissue around the blood. That would be wonderful. Now, that already exists for some types of cancer. Testicular cancer is one of them where there are chemotherapies that can virtually cure the patient with minimal side effects. Prostate cancer, sadly, there isn't anything quite so effective, but I'm sure that will come. That's the, the holy grail of this condition. I thought I'd just, um, I did mention about keeping the prostate healthy, and I thought I'd just talk a little bit about this. Uh, I don't want to bore you too much, so if you do feel bored, just, just, just say so. Um, people in the Far East, um, countries like China, Japan, they have a lower instance of the nastier types of prostate cancer, the, the tigers, if you like. Why is that? We don't know. It's a genetic problem. They certainly, when they go to the West, migrate to the West, their incidence of prostate cancer goes up. But never as high as the, the Western people. There's also a lower incidence of prostate cancer in the Mediterranean countries. That's been shown repeatedly in many studies. Is it the diet? Is it again genetics? We don't know. But definitely a higher incidence in Scandinav Scandinavian countries and Afro-Caribbean countries. I've just come from Tobago. Um, I was asked to do a, a talk on HIFO as it happens, and uh, I was told that Tobago has the highest incidence of prostate cancer um, in the world. So there are men, you know, I think they've lost three prime ministers to the disease. They shouldn't mm -hmm. just. So there must be a genetic element to it. There was also some very interesting talk in Tobago about the possibility of some infective agent, some viral agent that's passed. Now you probably have all heard about this screening program for women with cervical cancer, and mm -hmm. it's very tragic with Jane Goody. Uh, but it, it's highlighted that there, maybe there's something that will prevent young ladies and young women getting cancer in the future. And that's on the basis that research had shown that cervical cancer was caused by a viral agent, at least a large number of them. Are. So penile cancer, we think, uh, also has an element of that. And now people are talking about uh, some prostate cancers possibly being uh, implicated, uh, viral agent being implicated. But we don't know. We don't have enough evidence. So. Genetic, clearly, familial and dietary influences, I'm sure, um, have a role to play. And based on that, uh, people have looked at what are these factors. Sorry. Uh, one, one major factor is certainly dietary fat. And this is implicated in lots of cancers. In coronic cancer, bowel cancer definitely, kidney cancer in my field, and prostate cancer. We know that people who are overweight and people who have a diet rich in animal fat have a much higher incidence of prostate cancer. We do not know why. We, we don't know why. Uh, but that's just a, uh, an observation. We don't know if it's a cause or some effect. Maybe they're doing something else that's, uh, uh, that you know, the, the diet is, is rich in this and some, some other factor. Maybe the fat itself is purely coincidental. So we don't know the cause, but we do know that those patients who report in their dietary diary cards that they have a large amount of animal fat products, have a higher incidence of a number of cancers, and particularly uh, prostate cancer. And we do know in America, I saw a, um, a presentation from a surgeon who was showing that it's almost like a tsunami or a tidal wave going from east to west of obesity. And from the east, where it's all started, it's heading towards California. And along with that is, are coming uh, wash of cancers 
great rise in the increase in, in kidney cancer and prostate cancer. So I think they'll be busy with their, with their Da Vinci machines. Um, now, uh, in terms of in the diet, now I think we do know that there's a high uh, intake from a very early age of soya products, and we think this is protective uh, for prostate cancer. It's not absolutely proven, but we think plant products, they're called phytoestrogens, and these are the chemical names. There have been studies which have shown a, a protective um, role for these. We do not know, however, whether this is something you should be taking lifelong. Is it good enough just to start you know, taking this diet when you know, you've been detected for prostate cancer or maybe you've had a few biopsies which are biopsies which is negative and to be told right from now on you're still at risk, start taking this. I don't know if it would be any good at that stage. We don't know. These are questions that need to be answered. Brazil nuts. Well, I used to say because there was some evidence that selenium may have some beneficial effect for breast cancer and also prostate cancer. But recently, a, a study called SELECT, selenium, uh, vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, etc. These were looked at in America and it was published. And it, um, sadly, it hasn't shown a, a great influence in helping prostate cancer. So I have to pass that on to you. Those of you who are stuffing themselves in the Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> now, almonds, olive oil, leafy green vegetables, they contain vitamin E. Vitamin E probably is protective for certain things. I don't know. Uh, Probably you know that this, this is quite you know olive oil, all these green vegetables. That's quite common in the Mediterranean diet, and whether it protects against heart disease, uh, cardiologists think, epidemiologists epidemiolog think, but it's thought to have some protective um, effect on prostate cancer. There, there, there is some laboratory evidence, but we haven't done massive studies to, to support this, and that still needs to be done. Um, again, uh, there is this talk about lycopene, which is the red. Pigment is a bit like the tomatoes equivalent of carotene, which is the orange pigment. It's a, a related uh, in cats. It's a related pigment. It's red, and it's actually unlike many instances when you process a food, you you do the goodness out of it. This is a situation where it's the reverse. You actually can concentrate it in processed products like ketchup, and you can actually get a high, higher concentration of lycopene. Um, some people have read about this and take lycomatter capsules, which is that you get from orange and barrett. And, uh, that, I've been told, gives you 150 tomatoes worth. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the, the rationale? Well, it's meant to be an antioxidant. Um, antioxidants are meant to, uh, to mop up substances called free radicals. These are hmm. substances released in your bloodstream from chemical reactions, and they're meant to damage your cells, the DNA, uh, promote heart disease, promote cancer. So. Antioxidants such as vitamin C, lycopene, vitamin E are meant to soak up and uh, wrap, you know, envelop these free radicals so that they can't uh, harm you. That's the theory, but in practice we don't know. Now, uh, finasteride is, a, is that drug I told I didn't mention it in my name, but that's that drug which actually uh, has a role to reduce the size of the prostate gland. It's, this, it's the prostate shrinking drug, and it works very slowly over. Uh, many, many months. There has been a study which incidentally showed that it reduces the risk of prostate cancer. I'm not entirely sure about that, and many, many people in the States are not entirely sure about this. It could just be that it had an effect in, in delaying the development of cancers, and maybe they would show up anyway. Uh, so we're not 100% sure. It was only one study, but it's an intriguing and interesting study. I'm sure the drug company would want to sell it to every young man to try and prevent prostate cancer. So I think in summary that there isn't really absolute convincing evidence that diet, um, specific diets I should say, have an element to avoid, um, have an element in them to avoid the development of prostate cancer. You can't be guaranteed if you take this diet you won't have prostate cancer. But there's some very interesting um, information from population, populations around the world, their dietary habits um, as to what might be a good diet to have to reduce um, prostate cancer risk. There's also genetic issues as well. So I think a healthy diet is probably, I think I, I agree, I think the fruit and vegetables is probably a good thing. Uh, these are probably still uh, effective except for this one, no longer there, cross out that one. Um, and these are some newcomers, I think pomegranate juice is talked about as you know, quite good for uh, the health of, um, for breast and prostate cancer. 
blueberries are the super super fruit. Um, broccoli and related vegetables, such as uh, cauliflower. Not this cow. Animal fats are bad, and that is, I think, convincing. Actually, it's a lot of research. In fact, in patients who've had um, this is this study was published in uh, America in the University College Los uh, Los Angeles. Yes, sorry, University of California, Los Angeles, and they showed that patients who had had radiotherapy failure, they had um, radiotherapy for prostate cancer, and their blood tests were the PSA was going up again. When they went onto a diet which was completely free of uh, fat, animal fat. The two groups, one group continued on this and the other group uh, avoided it. And there was a big difference between the two. The, the better results uh, were with the, with the group that avoided animal fat. So, in uh, conclusions, I'm, I'm sure there will be newer and better conditions for treating, uh, better uh, drugs for and methods for treating prostate conditions. And these are all being researched currently and that will continue. Um, allowing for this economic downturn. I think money going into research is reducing, sadly, but I'm sure that's, that's to be expected. Better drugs with fewer side effects will emerge. That's the long-term goal. The newer chemotherapy perhaps will mimic what we've achieved in, in testicular cancer. So it does hold great promise, I think, the future. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.